Tanya Plibersek, welcome to Insiders. Good morning, Fran. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Tanya Plibersek, a shopping bag full of $100,000 cash plonked on a desk in the offices of the New South Wales Labor Party in Sydney, and no one apparently blinks an eye. What kind of show are they running there? Is Labor running there in Sydney? Yeah, well, it's completely unacceptable behaviour. It's absolutely clear that, uh, at the very least, uh, every person, every political party should be obeying the law. Uh, if we're, you know, very early days in the ICAC hearing, so we need to see what uh, emerges over the next few weeks. But there is a very strong case for culture change in an environment where you, you see that sort of response to very large political donations. Do you expect more to emerge in the coming five weeks? Look, I don't know. I, do, I just say we're very early days. And uh, I think it's important uh, absolutely to take responsibility uh, as a Labor Party member. We need to see culture change uh, in head office. But we also need to look at the broader case, what else needs to change in our political system. I'm, I've always been a very strong supporter of a New South Wales ICAC and a federal ICAC with real teeth because people need to have faith in our democracy, that money isn't influencing outcomes in our democracy. We should have lower disclosure thresholds at the federal level, not $14,000 as it is now, but $1,000. We should have faster real-time disclosure. Uh, we should also look at um, spending caps, I think. Uh, while there is an arms race, while ever there's an arms race uh, on uh, raising funds to do more political advertising, more direct voter contact, uh, you're going to have this pressure to raise money. And while you've got people like Clive Palmer able to put in, you know, 60, 70, 80 million dollars, whatever it was in the end, uh, to profoundly uh, influence the outcome of elections, we've got a problem with our democracy. And so what are you saying? Are you agreeing that... with Sam Dastyari an end to private donations? Look, I'm, I'm not really sure that I would handle it that way. Uh, I think the more important discussion to have is around limits on what we spend in advertising uh, or during campaigning, because that's where the pressure comes. There's an arms race to raise more money. Uh, I mean, you saw the sort of spending from Clive Palmer uh, in the last election campaign. Uh, while you've got pressure to combat that sort of advertising spend, you'll have pressure to raise money. All right, we need better disclosure. And the federal ICAC is the other element, Fran. A federal ICAC with real teeth, not this half-hearted, limp uh, thing that the coalition have proposed. Well, I think most voters would agree with that because, as we've seen in New South Wales, even where you have the rules, the rules can and are being broken. In terms of the culture problem for Labor in New South Wales, three former general secretaries implicated in this evidence so far. We're only at week one of a week six hearing. Um, so when you talk about culture change, what are you talking about? Is, is, national, uh, is federal intervention the answer here from the national executive? Look, we're still very early on and I think, I think it's wrong to sort of pre what else uh, this hearing will uh, go to over the coming weeks. I think it's important when we make these changes that we are thorough, thoughtful, reflective, that we make changes that really serve us well in the long run. Uh, so I don't want to preempt that. Um, but what I would say is, y yes, the focus is quite rightly on Labor at the moment. I'm not running away from that in any way. But it's not so long ago that 10, I think it was 10 Liberals, went to the crossbench or had to resign from Parliament in New South Wales because of donations. Uh, we see this uh, emerging as a problem right across our political culture. And we need to, yes, um, make changes in the Labor Party to encourage transparency and accountability, but also to look at our settings for, for all political parties so that people can have faith in our democracy itself. Just finally on this, Sam Dastyari heard about this donation back in 2016 apparently. When did you first hear about it? I <laughs> think in the news last week. Uh, it, it, I mean, uh, honestly, it, it is... Um, uh, it's disappointing in the extreme to, to many, many people in the Labor Party, me included, our ordinary branch members, uh, to think that uh, there's a kind of whatever it takes mentality in some of our people. Uh, and at the very least, we expect everybody to obey the law. But like I say, Fran, um, this is not, it's not 
uh, quarantined to the Labor no, Party. Sure. We need broader systemic change so that we can have faith in our political processes. Can I ask you about the Tamil family that the yeah. government's deporting to Sri Lanka or trying to? Uh, their case has been their case for protection has been all the way to the High Court. The High Court said no. Um, the government is not of a mind to intervene. We've seen that. Do you think they should be allowed to stay? And if so, what about all the others who have a similar case? What about precedent? Yeah, uh, well, a couple of things. Yes, they should be allowed to stay. And I know that our leader, Anthony Albanese, asked uh, Mr Morrison on their trip to East Timor to intervene to allow this family to stay. I think there, um, there is a difference. Well, first of all, it's a bit rich for Peter Dutton to talk about precedent when he's, he's prepared to use uh, his um, ministerial powers to allow au pairs to enter the country. Um, sure, that was is... temporary. This is a, a different order of thing. Sure, but the point is... He's not afraid of uh, creating a precedent in that instance. And he is prepared to use his ministerial discretion. Ministerial discretion is in our immigration laws for a reason. It's so that common sense can apply. And when there are strong, compassionate circumstances, you can apply that common sense. This is a family that is working, volunteering, raising their children in a regional community. We've got a government crying out for migrants to move to regional communities. They are well integrated, they are well supported in that community. They're living peacefully, paying their taxes, raising their kids. Uh, it, it is without question one of those examples where common sense and compassion would say, use your ministerial discretion, uh, let's, just, uh, let's just let these, th this family stay. Of course we are up for strong border protection, but that doesn't make us incapable of using our common sense when there is a family that has been here for so long and is so well integrated. OK, can I ask you about the Draft um, Religious Discrimination Act that was released by the Attorney-General this week? Uh, LGBT groups and other groups say the bill punches hole, holes in the anti-discrimination laws of the states. Will Labor ever support provisions that undermine or diminish state anti-discrimination laws? Well, the first thing to say is um, we want to work with the government cooperatively on protecting religious freedoms. We are uh, absolutely supporters of uh, religious freedoms and the ability to uh, live your faith and, and uh, to profess your faith. This legislation, um, we've only had it for a few days and there are some problems already emerging with it. And those problems are being pointed out pretty vocally by members of the Liberal Party, so we're not sure what further changes the Liberals will make. So, first of all, we'll consult broadly with churches and uh, the gay lesbian community and others who are affected. Um, we will see what the government finally comes back with. with What's your instinct, though, generally, on, on weakening uh, anti-discrimination laws that the states already have in place? Well, I think that would be a real problem with this legislation. I think it's uh, something that Christian Porter promised he wouldn't do, interfere with state laws. And I'm sure that uh, the overriding of state laws in this instance is probably driven by Erica Betts and um, some of the extreme right uh, because they've got problems with the Tasmanian laws. That is something that uh, I think we would be, uh, we would find very difficult to support. But it, we have to go through our proper processes on this. Um, I'd also say that the, the provisions that affect the business community, the businesses are already saying, how is this going to work for us? We have to prove economic loss. What, what's the process? This is the so-called Israel the... Falau clause. Y yeah. I, so I think there are obviously issues with this. It's legislation that's been drafted to try and settle down all of the Liberal Party internals. It hasn't done that. They're exploding already. Um, so we've got a long way to go. OK, can I go now to some matters in your portfolio this week? Yeah. The NAPLAN results again showed little or no improvement. Student scores barely improved over a decade of testing. Uh, in some groups, reading, writing and maths have gone backwards. There's plenty of critique from the states that the tests are too hard or too soft or too boring. Um, but what's happening? I mean, our kids are no dumber than kids in other countries and they're not learning the three R's to a required level. The problem is not the test, is it? The problem is, is the teaching. The kids aren't learning. Yeah. So, so I think it's time to have a look at the test. It's been there for 10 years and, it, you know, it, it's absolutely right to have a refresh, have a look at it with fresh eyes. But it's not fundamentally the test that's a problem. It's three things. Uh, it's um, the declining funding that we've seen in recent years. 
uh, it's the just let's track, track. let's stop there because I can hear government members all around the country going. We haven't declined the funding; it's gone up twenty billion in the last yeah. um, several years. Um, yeah. That's a lot of more, money. We've got more students, and we've got inflation. Yeah, so it hasn't the, the actually declined. Is, it's gone up by overall when you take all that into account about two billion. Uh, well, and billions less than was promised to schools sure. uh, under the needs-based funding formula. But the point is, Fran, if you don't have adequate funding for our schools, you can't give kids one-on-one -on -one attention. You can't pick up the kids who are struggling and give them the help they need to catch up. You can't extend your gifted and talented kids. You can't enrich the program with things like music, musical instruments. Uh, and it means that um, teachers don't get the professional development that they need. They don't have the time to observe highly experienced teachers. You can't have those highly I experienced teachers all mentoring that. others. There is a reason, Fran, that parents are this weekend doing sausage sizzles and cake stalls and fundraisers for their schools. Money matters. And we saw improvements in the early years of needs-based funding that have now stalled. OK, Money but we've been talking, matter. I think I've probably had this conversation with you over several years now, and still, not just on Lapland, but internationally, you know, we're behind Russia yeah. and Ireland in maths. We're behind Estonia and Poland in our reading. Yeah. Um, some so things are not... working. What we've learnt from Lapland is some things are working in some states and some schools. Why? When are we ever going to learn the simple thing of, oh, that's working, let's roll that out across the country? Good question, Fran, and um, that's why we had a $280 million evidence institute planned if we were elected, so that we would take best practice, what's really improving results, making sure that kids have the basics and spread that best practice to every school. So best practice becomes common practice. We absolutely need to do that. We don't use evidence in education in the way that we use it in our health system. And the third thing, Fran, is teaching. We need to attract and retain the best and brightest into teaching. In schools, in systems that are successful, it's the top 30% of kids that go into teaching degrees. Now, there'll always be exceptions to that rule. You might have struggled in year 12, but have the capacity to be a great teacher. But what we're seeing now is universities continuing to drop their entry marks for teaching degrees, and that is a serious problem. Can I just we ask need... you, we're almost out of time, just you mentioned universities, I want to go to that sector now. I spoke to one VC, Vice-Chancellor this week, who said unis are being shamed unfairly because of the numbers of international and particularly Chinese students they've enrolled. That's how they're feeling, shamed. Should our universities be ashamed of the number of foreign students they have on campus or is, is this issue, issue being caught up in something bigger? Well, they certainly shouldn't be shamed. I mean, universities are targeting foreign students because they've seen um, budget cuts that mean um, also an extra 200,000 Australian students will miss out on universities. But international education is unequivocally a good thing for Australia. It's a $33 billion industry uh, and it means that our students are exposed to students from around the world. They learn from those students and those students international students go home, we hope, with a great impression of Australia and a feeling of friendship for Australia. But it has to be a good quality education. You can't allow standards to slip because you're chasing those international students. So we have to have high standards of English and a great student experience for those international students. And, and just that on that finally, do you think the yeah. unis are delivering this? I mean, some of the unis, RMIT, I think, have over 40% foreign students. Do you think standards are being allowed to slip? I'm not saying at RMIT. And that the, um, the unis have the balance right, the numbers right, just briefly? Look, I, I think there are... Um, I think there are examples you could point to where universities could be doing better on things like English language and student experience. But overall, our international education system is excellent. And in fact, we've overtaken the UK as a, as a student destination and because we offer excellent education. There's always room for caution. There's always room for improvement. But, but I'd say to, um, to any student considering an education in Australia, Come, we can give you a, a great education and a great experience of Australian life. Tanya Plibersek, thanks for joining us on Insiders. Thank you.